This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. You hear a doctor talking to a new patient called Mrs. Black. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Mrs. Black, isn't it? Yes. I believe it's your first time to this clinic? Uh, yes, we've just moved to the area, so we're looking for a new GP. Right. Well, how can I help you today? Oh, well, I'm actually a bit worried about our daughter, Mia. Well, she's 15 now, and she's always been very healthy, but recently she's gotten very thin, and I'm worried that it might be anorexia. Okay, I see. Can you tell me a little bit more about Mia? Uh, well, she always used to eat with the family, but lately she says she hasn't got time to eat with us because she's too busy, so she takes a plate into her room and eats in there. She skips breakfast a lot as well, or just has a glass of juice, a couple of bites of toast before she goes out the door and off to school. Mm -hmm. It all started late last year, but I'm really not sure what triggered the change. And what about school? How's she going? Oh, she's a good student. She gets high marks in most exams. Her teachers have always said she's a quiet girl, but she works really hard. Now that I think of it, her maths teacher told us at a recent parent-teacher interview that lately she seems to be having trouble concentrating in class. He said that she was never like that before, and he wondered if we could think of any reason why it might be happening now. I see. She doesn't have many friends, just one or two girls she's close with. She, she's always been a bit shy and reserved. She doesn't have a boyfriend, and we wouldn't allow her to her age anyway. After school, she does ballet, which she loves. But apart from that, she tends to spend a lot of time lying around the house, usually in her room. Hmm. And what about her weight? You said she'd become quite thin? Yeah, she, she really has. I've tried talking to her about it, but of course she won't tell me how much. Her clothes don't seem to fit her properly anymore, though. They just hang off her like sacks. She seems obsessed about her appearance lately too. I always catch her standing in front of the mirror. I don't think she's sleeping very well either. She stays up very late at night, reading or playing around on her phone. And then of course she'll be tired and moody in the morning. Anything else you can tell me about Mia? Oh yeah, she seems to have been getting a lot of headaches lately. I can't remember her really having them before. And I found a box of laxatives in her room. I even think she's been throwing up, but she denies it, of course. So that's a big concern for her father and me too. So what do you think, Doctor, from what I've told you? Do you think Mia has anorexia? Well, without meeting Mia and assessing her, which I think I'll need to do, it's hard to make that judgment. However, I can give you some information about anorexia, and then I think we need to arrange for me to see your daughter sooner rather than later. Okay, I understand. Anything you can tell me, any advice you might have, would be very helpful. We've tried talking to her to see if she's all right, but she's very sensitive about it all. The moment we mention anything, she gets very upset. I do understand it's difficult, but the good news is there are options available. If we think it's necessary, we may even have to consider referral to a psychiatrist.
Extract two questions 13 to 24. In this task, you'll hear a physiotherapist talking to a patient called Ryan Henderson. Answer the questions below by completing the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Ryan Henderson, please come in and take a seat. My name's Kathy. I understand from your GP that you've got a problem with your knee. Oh, hi there. Yeah, that's right. It's just the left knee, just below the kneecap. It started about four weeks ago. I first noticed it when I'd go for a run. I'd get this sort of niggling pain, which would get increasingly worse. It's gotten to the point where sometimes I even have to cut my run short. Hmm. Does anything else seem to aggravate it? Mm, yeah, actually, going from um, when I'm sitting and then standing, or when I'm sitting at a desk with my knee bent, I really feel the pain then. It's not very sore at the moment, but it seems to be getting worse as the day goes on. It doesn't wake me up when I'm sleeping or anything like that, but it seems to go away during the night, and I suppose that's why it feels better in the mornings. Okay. Do you have any other symptoms like pins and needles or numbness in your knee? Um, no, nothing like that. Do you have any history of injuries or accidents that might account for the pain? Well, I cut my left knee pretty badly climbing over a concrete wall when I was younger, but that was about 15 years ago or more, so I don't think that would have anything to do with this. It gave me a pretty crazy scar though. Ah, I see. Other than that, I've just had your typical sorts of injuries. I broke the little toe in my left foot playing football when I was about 10. Ever since then, I've had to wear shoes a size larger. Then, when I was about 25, I twisted my right ankle playing squash and ended up breaking a small bone and just here, the, what's it called, is it the fibula? Ah, oh, yes, that's right. Okay, um, but it's been fine, haven't had any problems with it since. Then just last year, I broke the little finger on my right hand playing rugby. Totally unexpected, that was. And, and I, I almost forgot, I've had this bursitis in my left hip. And when was that? Last year, I saw one of your colleagues, actually, for some physio treatment, and they said to take a break from running for six months, which I did. I did a lot of stretching, and I started doing yoga twice a week. It seemed to help, so I was able to start running again after Christmas. And is the bursitis better now? Yep, there's no pain in the hip. Now it's the darn knee that's giving me grief. Yeah, well, can I just get you to stand for me and put your full weight on your left leg? Yeah, sure. Tell me, how does that feel? Any pain or discomfort? Yeah, I can feel it is a bit niggly just at the front of the kneecap, and I do feel a bit of pain. And if you do like a little half squat, bend your knees and come back up, what's that like? Oh, ow. I can feel a bit of pain in both knees, actually. More in my left knee, like a sharp pain, but there's definitely a little ache in that right knee now as well. I'll just try standing on my left leg again and see what that's like. Oh, that really hurts. A lot worse? Definitely. Okay. Can you sit on the side of the bed and I'm just going to test the muscle strength. I want you to push your right leg out against me as hard as you can go. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. It's harder to do with my left leg though. Like it's weaker or something. Like I can't get enough power for it. That's really strange. I hadn't realised it was that weak before. Well, Ryan, I think I know what's going on with your knee. It appears that your kneecap is a little bit out of alignment. Oh, wow, okay. And how does that happen? It can occur because the ligament, which we call the iliotibial band, it's gotten a bit too tight on the outside of your thigh. And in your case, I can see that there is some minor swelling on the outside of your left knee, which means there's some underlying inflammation there. I guess that explains the pain then. Seems like my days of pounding the pavement might be over. I might have to find some other way of getting my exercise. That's really disappointing. I've been into running since I was in secondary school, used to be on the cross-country team and everything, but now it seems like every time I lace up, I get problems.
That is the end of Part A. Now, look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at the question 25 you hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about ingredients used in a vaccine. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. Can you explain what ingredients are used in a vaccine? Well, Chemicals used in a vaccine include a suspending fluid, such as sterile saline or fluids containing protein, preservatives such as glycine, albumin, and phenol, and enhancers or adjuvants to improve the effectiveness of the vaccine. Some vaccines may also contain trace amounts of the culture material for the growth of the virus or bacteria used in the vaccine, such as chicken egg protein. Even trace amount chemicals added to vaccines to deactivate a bacteria or virus and stabilize the vaccine and to keep the vaccine potent over time. Question 26. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about vancomycin-resistant enterococci. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What are vancomycin-resistant enterococci? Vancomycin-resistant enterococci are particular types of antimicrobial-resistant bacteria that are resistant to vancomycin. This is often used to treat infections caused by enterococci. Enterococci are bacteria that are normally present in the intestines and in the female genital tract that are commonly found in the environment that can cause infections at times. Most of the times, vancomycin-resistant enterococci infections occur in hospitals. Often the infection is caused in patients with chronic diseases such as diabetes or who have recently received antibiotics. It's also more common in patients with indwelling devices like intravenous lines or urinary catheters and those with compromised immune systems. Vancomycin-resistant enterococci can cause many types of infections, such as urinary infection, heart infections called endocarditis, bloodstream infection called sepsis, abscesses, wound infections, pneumonia, or meningitis. The risk of vancomycin-resistant enterococci infection can be reduced by minimizing the use of indwelling devices, such as intravenous lines and urinary catheters. The risk can also be reduced by avoiding inappropriate use of antibiotics. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about the causes of Shapara hemorrhagic fever. Now, read the question. Doctor, how are the Shapara hemorrhagic fever is caused? A single-strand RNA virus called a Shapare virus of the Aranaviridae family causes Shapare hemorrhagic fever. Shapare virus is animal-borne or zoonotic infection. Limited clinical trial information about this infection in rural Bolivia. Like any other Aranaviridae, rodents host Shapare virus as a reservoir. 
Humans can contract this infection with a contact from an infected rodent. It can be direct or through inhalation or aerosolized Shaper virus from the feces or urine of infected rodents. Although there is a possibility of person-to-person -person transmission of arenaviruses through aerosolization, it's very rare. From the very limited observed cluster of cases of Shaper hemorrhagic fever, there was hardly any evidence of person-to-person -person transmission. Question 28. You hear a dialogue between two physicians discussing about teniasis. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What is teniasis? Teniasis is a parasitic infection caused by the tapeworm species pork tapeworm or Tinea cilium, beef tapeworm or Tinea saginata, and Asian tapeworm or Tinea asiatica. Typically, people become infected with these tapeworms by eating raw or undercooked pork or beef. Often, individuals with teniasis infection may not know they have an infection because symptoms are non-existent or mild. Especially pork tapeworm infections can result in sister cirrhosis, a disease that can cause seizures. Question 29. You hear a monologue by a physician briefing about rickettsiosis. Now, read the question. A group of diseases called spotted fever group, rickettsiosis, is called by closely related bacteria. Through the bite of infected ticks and mites, these bacteria spread to people. The most severe and commonly reported spotted fever group rickettsiosis is in the Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Other causes of spotted fever group rickettsiosis in the U.S. include rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis caused by R. parkeri rickettsial pox caused by rickettsia acari, Pacific Coast tick fever caused by rickettsia philippi. Question 30. You hear a dialogue between two physicians discussing about health care associated infections. Now, read the question. Doctor, what is the cause health care associated infections? Different types of healthcare associated infections, including pneumonia, wound, bloodstream infections, or surgical site infections, and meningitis caused by Klebsiella is a type of gram negative bacteria. Increasingly, Klebsiella bacteria have developed antimicrobial resistance, and very recently, it has developed to the antibiotics called carbapenems. Normally, Klebsiella bacteria are found in the intestines, where they do not cause any disease. They are also found in feces. Commonly, Klebsiella infections occur among sick patients in healthcare settings, patients whose care needs devices such as ventilators or intravenous catheters. Moreover, patients taking long courses of certain antibiotics are at high risk for Klebsiella infections. That is the end of Part B. Now, look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. 
For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a doctor and a nurse on the symptoms, signs, and causes of vulvovaginal candidiasis infection. You have 90 seconds to read the questions 31 to 36. Hello, doctor. Can you explain how vulvovaginal candidiasis infection occurs, its symptoms, and its treatment? Vulvovaginal candidiasis is a syndrome rather than an infection, and diagnosis of vulvovaginal candidiasis does not rely on clinical or laboratory criteria alone, but a combination of these two. Usually, vulvovaginal candidiasis is caused by C. albicans, but can occasionally be caused by other candida sp or yeasts. Typical symptoms of vulvovaginal candidiasis include vaginal soreness, pruritus, dyspareunia, abnormal vaginal discharge, and external dysuria. However, none of these symptoms are specific for vulvovaginal candidiasis. About 75% of women will have at least one episode of vulvovaginal candidiasis, and 40 to 45% will have two or more episodes. Based on clinical presentation, microbiology, host factors, and response to therapy, vulvovaginal candidiasis can be classified as either uncomplicated or complicated. About 10 to 20 percent of women will have complicated vulvovaginal candidiasis requiring special diagnostic and therapeutic considerations. Types of uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis are sporadic or infrequent vulvovaginal candidiasis, mild to moderate vulvovaginal candidiasis, likely to be candida albicans on immunocompromised women, Complicated vulvovaginal candidiasis are recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. Several vulvovaginal candidiasis, non-albicans candidiasis, women with diabetes, immunocompromising conditions, debilitation, or immunosuppressive therapy. By the presence of symptoms such as external dysuria and vulvar pruritus, pain, swelling, and redness, a diagnosis of candida vaginitis is suggested clinically. Signs include fissures, vulvar edema, excoriations, and thick curdy vaginal discharge. The diagnosis can be made in a woman with signs and symptoms of vaginitis when either a gram stain or rep preparation of vaginal discharge demonstrates budding yeasts. Pseudo hi-fi, hi-fi, or a culture or other test yields a positive result for a yeast species. Use of 10% KOH preparation in wet preparations improves the visualization of mycelium and yeast by disrupting cellular material that might obstruct the visuality of yeast or pseudo hi-fi. 
Examination of a wet mount with KOH preparation should be performed for all patients with symptoms or signs of vulvovaginal candidiasis. For patients with negative wet mounts but existing symptoms or signs, vaginal cultures for candida should be considered. In case candida cultures cannot be performed, then an empiric treatment can be considered. Identifying candida by culture in the absence of signs or symptoms is not an indication for treatment, since approximately 20% of women harbor candida SP and other yeasts in the vagina. However, postcoital testing for yeast is not approved by Food and Drug Administration. Culture for yeast remains the gold standard for diagnosis. Vulvovaginal candidiasis can occur concomitantly with sexually transmitted diseases. Most healthy women with uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis have no identifiable precipitating factors. Short course topical formulations effectively treat uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis. The topically applied azole drugs are highly effective than nicotin. Treatment with azoles results in relief of symptoms and negative cultures in 90% of patients who complete therapy. Over-the-counter intravaginal agents clotrimazole, 1% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 7 to 14 days, or clotrimazole, 2% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 3 days, or myconazole, 2% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 7 days, myconazole, 4% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 3 days, or myconazole, 100 milligram vaginal suppository, 1 suppository daily for 7 days, or myconazole, 200 gram vaginal suppository, 1 suppository for 3 days, or myconazole, 1200 milligram vaginal suppository, 1 suppository for 1 day. Teoconazole, 6.5% ointment, 5 grams intravaginally in a single application. Prescription intravaginal agents, butoconazole, 2% cream, 5 grams intravaginally in a single application, or terconazole, 0.4% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 7 days, or Terconazole, 0.8% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 3 days. Terconazole, 80 milligrams vaginal suppository, 1 suppository daily for 3 days. Oral agent, fluconazole, 150 milligrams orally in a single dose. Now, look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the doctor giving a lecture on colon polyps and its treatment. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
A colon polyp is a tiny growth of tissue projecting from the lining of a section of the large intestine called colon. Polyps are common and occurs as people age. Usually, colorectal polyps in the rectum or colon occur in 30% of adults above 50 years in the U.S., while in children, colorectal polyps occur with an estimated 6% affected to 12% in those who experience intestinal bleeding. Although most colon or bowel polyps are harmless, some polyps develop as cancer that takes many years to turn cancerous. The most common types of polyps are hyperplastic polyps and adentomatous polyps. Usually, hyperplastic polyps or inflammatory polyps are harmless and not a cause for severe concern with a low malignant potential. Rarely, these polyps become cancerous. Although adenomous or adenomatous polyps are not cancerous, they are potential enough to become cancerous in the future. Larger adenomous are more likely to become cancerous. Resection of adenomous polyps is usually recommended. Malignant polyps contain cancerous cells. The best treatment for malignant polyps will be based on the severity of the cancer and the overall health of the patient. The symptoms of colon polyps are rectum bleeding is the most common symptom of polyps, though it can also be a sign of other conditions, such as minor tears in the anus or hemorrhoids. Large polyps that block the bowel movements partially can cause abdominal cramps and pain. Heavy bleeding from polyp can make the stool appear black, while minor polyp bleeding can cause red stripes in the stool. However, other factors such as medicines, foods, and supplements can also cause a change in the color of the stool. If a polyp bleeds slowly over time, it may cause an iron deficiency in the patients. Usually, iron deficiency, called anema, causes pale skin, weakness, shortness of breath, fainting, or lightheadedness. There may be a change in bowel movements lasting longer than a week, including diarrhea or constipation. Eating too much of red meat may cause the risk of colon polyps. Although etiology of colon polyps is not yet known, their occurrence may be connected with certain lifestyle factors, such as a high-fat diet, eating too much red meat, not including adequate fiber in the diet, smoking, obesity. Genetic factors can also cause the colon cells to multiply over and above and form polyps in certain individuals. Certain individuals are more likely to develop colon polyps if they have inherited conditions, such as familial adenomatous polyposis, Gardner syndrome, or poots jager syndrome. Colon polyps are usually removed by the following methods. In the colonoscopy procedures, a cutting instrument or an electrified wire loop on the end of a colonoscopy is used to perform a polypectomy. However, smaller polyps are raised and isolated from the surrounding area for easier removal by injecting a liquid underneath the polyp. In a laparoscopy, a small incision is made into the pelvis or abdomen. An instrument called a laparoscope is inserted into the bowel. This technique is used to remove very large polyps or if the polyps cannot be removed safely by colonoscopy. Removing the colon and rectum. In this procedure, called a proctocolectomy, is only performed when the patient has severe condition or cancer in which the colon and rectum are removed surgically. This method is suggested for patients with rare inherited conditions, such as familial adenomatous polyposis that causes cancer of the colon and rectum, and polyp removal may prevent further development of cancer. This is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.